All right, so hopefully you're sort of catching on to the pattern here. We talked about axial forces, normal forces. We talked about axial moments, torsion, right? Now we're talking about transfer. We talked about transverse moments. Transverse moment is a bending moment. And that leaves us with one left, right? Axial force, axial moment, transverse moment, now transverse force. Uh, and so that's what transverse shear is. Okay, transverse shear is a shear that acts perpendicular to the long axis of the beam. So if our beam is like this, it's acting across that length. And we can see an example of that with a railroad tie here, right? This steel rail, which has a great weight pace placed upon it, is pushing down on this railroad tie and it's pushing across that tie, right? Down, the beam is horizontal, the force is vertical. We know from early on the average shear stress in that situation. Uh, and we calculated that with this equation here. Uh, but well, that was a big simplification. Uh, and it really only has to do with a, a beam that is very narrow. It has a very small cross-sectional area. And now we're going to talk uh, and, and complicate that vision a little bit. And one of the complications that happens here is related to the complementary property of shear. If you remember when we talked about shear, we said, well, if we've got a shear in this direction, right, then there has to be an uh, opposing shear on the other side of our differential cube, right, that keeps it in balance in the vertical direction. But if we just had those two, then this uh, cuboid would start spinning around, right? We have a big moment around the center. So we have to have something opposing that moment uh, and that means we have to have a shear on top and in bottom that balance each other so it doesn't move in a horizontal direction, uh, but also balances the moment created by those vertical shears. So the complementary property of shear suggests that if we have a shear in one direction of a cube, we're going to have a shear on uh, the other three uh, so that we can remain uh, at equilibrium. So what does that mean for us here? Uh, well, it implies that if a shear acts on one surface, it's going to act on all four of those surfaces. Uh, and this creates the really interesting result that if I push down on, say, this railroad tie, not only do I create a shear across it, but I create a shear along it, right? These shears are going to be approximately order of magnitude the same size as those shears, uh, but they're going to be along the length of uh, our railroad tie here. And that makes a big difference with wood particularly, uh, because wood's really good at resisting this shear. Uh, it's not very good at resisting that shear in the longitudinal direction because of the grain of the wood. Um, and that really makes this a complicated problem, in part just to get our head around, like, right, you know, how do we, how do these shears balance each other um, at the differential level um, and across the face? So, like I said, that can create failure in the longitudinal direction, especially with uh, wood or with glued uh, pieces or with uh, nails. And we can see that in these images, right? If I didn't bond these pieces of wood together and I press down in the middle, this makes sense to us, right? All of these are going to bend at the same radius of curvature. Um, and that means that we're going to get the same strain on the bottom part of this first board as we get on the bottom part of that first second board. But we're going to get a compressive strain on the top and then on the top. So we're actually going to see that um, those boards slide against each other, right? What does that sliding against each other suggest? It suggests shear, right? So we've got some shear that's happening as these uh, wooden boards slide against each other. But if they're bonded, they're not going to slide. And that gives us that internal resultant force, right? We've got an internal shear stress 
that's acting right here because this guy wants to wants to expand uh, and this guy wants to compress um, but neither can because they're bonded to each other uh, and so that's going to create a lot of stress uh, within that set of boards that same thing is happening in every member that experiences a transverse stress like this um, it's just that the bonding is going to be molecular bonding right or struct or microstructural bonding that's holding different layers of that material together now the complex nature of that is going to create a really um, complicated uh, result so if we look at this guy down here you can see um, that it's really deforming it in what's called a, a warping fashion it's uh, it's not very predictable um, as those different uh, shear strengths uh, or shear uh, stresses act on this piece um, those are going to be small enough that we're going to be able to ignore them for the most part we're, we're not going to pay too much attention to them we're just going to try and figure out what those stresses are but it does you know if we add enough of that stress we're going to really warp a piece of uh, material All right, so the next step is to actually try to quantify some of those shear stresses. Uh, and to do that, we're going to use what's called the shear formula. And this is a more complex formula than what we've used up, up to this point in the class. As you might guess from saving this for the, for the last week of class, we're kind of ending with the things that get more complex. Um, and so our shear formula looks like this guy here. And you can tell. Part of the complexity here is we've got a lot, a lot of uh, primes and bars uh, trying to keep track of different stuff. So learning to do these problems requires that we start to understand uh, what these different um, uh, signifiers mean. Uh, so let's think about this. This is telling us that the shear stress at Y prime, okay, so Y prime is a distance from our neutral axis, okay. Uh, is going to be V, the transverse force that's applied, our second moment of inertia, or second moment of area, rather, that's we call the moment of inertia, the thickness T, and then this Q here, which is technically the first moment of area of this guy up here, this shaded region. And so this is important if we think about this, why, why does Q matter? The more material we have above this point, the more shear stress we're going to have here, right? Because this guy is trying to bend a little bit. Um, and if we have a lot of material up here, that's going to that's gonna mean that the internal forces and moments are going to be stronger at this point here. Um, so V is our internal shear stress, I is the moment of inertia, T is our thickness, and Q looks like this. So this, you can see this looks like at a moment of area, and it is, but it's of, D, of A prime, and A prime is just that area up there. So we actually have to uh, think about what that is, and we can simplify this by figuring out what the centroid of that area, and so Y prime bar uh, is the centroid of the area above Y, y prime, um, and then we're multiplying it by that area of A prime. That's a lot, right? Um, and we'll try and get that worked out. This guy's all worked up. He doesn't like <laughs> he doesn't like all these different things. Um, so it is complicated, uh, and it'll take a little bit of getting used to. But you know, right? This year formula is a pain to use, but that means it's really useful. <laughs> Maybe not. I feel like that was a Dr. Dyer. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> there are a lot of, because this is such a complex situation mechanically, um, simplifications are less um, useful, even though it's more complicated. So not, not our favorite combina com uh, combination of um, more complicated and less useful. So when does this work? Uh, well, if we have 
a short or flat cross section. Um, in other words, if the distance in this direction uh, is not very high, um, then this uh, shear formula doesn't work as well. If we have sudden changes in a cross section, uh, such as where a flange, this flange up here joins a web, so like right here, uh, this wouldn't be very accurate. Uh, and if we have a cross-sectional joint that's not 90 degrees, like a Y-shaped cross-section, uh, here we have a nice T-shape, right, with two 90-degree angles. Uh, this would be even less dependable if we had a Y-shaped cross-section. Uh, and there are ways to adjust for these. We're not going to dig into those uh, in this class. Um, but again, you would guess, you guess, they're going to come with more complications. So the practical implication of the shear formula, if we went back and looked at our shear formula, um, that Q times V uh, means that there's uh, essentially a squared term in there. And so our shear is distributed parabolically. So here we can see a representation of that shear. It's going to be highest in the middle uh, and it's going to get smaller as we go to the edges, but it's not a linear relationship, it's a parabolic relationship. So that's different than our bending equation. Okay, so this is a distribution not only of transverse shear, but also of longitudinal shear, a shear, uh, because those are going to be roughly equal at all, any given point. Um, and if we think about that, that makes some sense, right? We can't have any shear stress on the top surface um, with air around it. It's just going to move that air if it, if it needed to. Um, and so the shear value is going to be near zero at the top, and it's going to get higher and higher towards the middle. And so if you look at an old building, in fact, I'm standing in my attic here, and I, can I show you this? Let me see. <laughs> Let me see if I can get you to see. If you can see on that beam right there, notice where it's cracking. Okay, um, that's typical of a wood beam. Um, that one's not. That's under a normal stress. Um, but we see the same thing on um, horizontal beams. Uh, they tend to crack in the middle there. Um, and along the grain. And so we see that same thing right here. Okay, so uh, key point here uh, conceptually is this parabolic distribution of shear stress and the fact that it's a longitudinal shear stress as well as a transverse one. 